Welcome to this week's episode of Heartfelt Perspectives with your host, Cheryl Jennings. Known as the Caregiver Whisperer, Cheryl has experienced caring for her special needs son and various family members at the same time, which instilled a profound empathy for individuals seeking support. Cheryl has accomplished 150 plus weekly podcasts interviewing caregivers before writing her book, It Takes Courage to Be a Caregiver. Her mission is to help families understand their roles in caring for other families while protecting the caregiver's health. Let's get into this week's episode. All right, today we have a guest with us, and Diane Nuts is here to uh, be with me today. I have gotten to know her in the last few months, and she's such a delightful person. And it's interesting how we can get connected to someone who introduces us to another person that has such an impact in our lives. And Diane has started a nonprofit organization, and that's how I got to know her. And I would like to just let Diane tell us a little bit about your your life and what you do. Diane, welcome today. Glad to have you, you, Cheryl. It's great to be here. I and have a lot of life experiences. And my husband and I married. We had six kids and had added two more to that. Uh, we did not have any children with special needs, but I went into the special education field because I felt a passion for that early in my life. My father worked in thrift stores, operational managers in Southern California, and the profits went to the retarded. Um, and I became really interested in those unique individuals, and I saw that they were looked at less important than anybody else, and that made me upset. So when I needed to work, I decided that that was going to be my career, and I did that for 35 years. Um, we retired then after we were 65, and then the pandemic hit, and I had so many parents, so many that I haven't even met before, reaching out to me on social media, mainly frustrated and totally exhausted because their children with special needs had no outlet, no school, no therapies. It was really devastating to them. And they and I recognize that they need a break. It's it's imperative for all of us as a human being to get a break and recharge our batteries. And we don't have the kind of income where I can send people gift cards to go to a restaurant, to go to a movie, to get a massage. And so I decided to start a nonprofit. This is really out of my comfort zone to start a nonprofit. <laughs> and it wasn't my thing. Um, I did write two books about my experiences working with special needs. And that's how a lot of people got to know me, basically, is they understood that I was passionate about their special families. So a little bit about those books, what so that people will know what for. Okay. Is it okay if I just show them to you? Sure. Oh, I'm glad you, yes. That's the same way. I have mine in the other room. I forgot to bring it in. So, so yeah. the, the look in me is basically, I'm trying to see which way to throw this. My experience working with people with all kinds of different special needs, autism, Down syndrome, Asperger's, um, physical, mental disabilities, and sharing some humor because all of us have humor in our lives and it's okay to laugh and joke and to have fun with your life. And also making people realize that everyone has potential in their lives. No matter if they can talk, eat, or walk or not, they all have a potential. Some some I believe are put on this earth just to make us smile <laughs> and to add love to our lives. 
so that was the first book and that book took me two years to write and to publish because I self-published. I was new at that. I, I'm going on 70 this year, so I didn't have any experiences to help me with that. <laughs> My children were a little bit frustrated at times. Oh, mom, come on. <laughs> you don't know how to do that. So I well, wasn't there. Seems you have it easier when it comes to technology because they've grown up with it and we're learning it later in life. And it's like a new challenge all the time. It is, isn't it? We found that out today. <laughs> Just get this set up. And I wasn't going to write anymore because that was really hard. But then somebody at church was asking me about their granddaughter who had Down syndrome. Oh, I wish you could have put her story in your book. And I walked away from her and the title popped in my head, Side of Side of Down. Cool. So that one is some of my experiences, but of course I didn't work only with children who had Down syndrome. So a lot of it are, are interviews with parents who have gotten past the infant stage of raising their children who are on Down syndrome. And there are some amazing stories in there of great families. And these families are so inspirational to me. We had eight typical healthy children and that was hard enough. They have so much more on their plate, but they just go with the flow most of the time and amaze me. So I really loved interviewing these families who had children with Down syndrome. One family has four. Four children with Down syndrome that has family? And only one was adopted. Wow. Um, they, well, my life's actually experience. Yeah, they just, they wanted a healthy, typical child, and they were looking at the adoption options out there, and they could not take their eyes off the children with a Down syndrome. Oh. <laughs> so... There you go for that family. So That's why well, the first book. Tell us a little bit more about the Look in Me book. We didn't see the fit very well. Okay, let me draw that up there again. Hold it over your right shoulder and see if that'll Look in Me, a life shaped by the most overlooked. Okay. Can't really see it. That's well. good. Yes, that's a lot better. Yeah. Um uh, there are some great stories in there. One of the funny stories at the beginning is when my first four children were really young. They were like eight years old and under. And I taught them about people that are different through the appearance because children are so honest and open. They will walk up to somebody. I mean, sometimes they walk up to a woman who's just round and they say, you're having a baby and she's not. <laughs> so I, I tried to teach them to be polite, not stare. It's okay to smile. It's okay to say hi. If somebody's missing a leg or an arm, you know, that can be a little bit scary for a child. I thought I covered all my bases. But one day we were in a grocery store and I saw a little person, a grown woman, and I thought, uh-oh, I didn't cover that one. I've covered the blind, you know, the cripple, and hearing impaired, and I covered all that, but I forgot about the little person. You don't run across them very often. And so while we were in the grocery store, I made sure to stay out of her aisle that she was shopping in. We would even stop and read the labels longer. And then finally I was done with my groceries and I pushed my children in, in the cart up to the line and I was, whew, okay, we made it. Well, she got <laughs> lined right behind us. So my nightmare began. <laughs> I, my oldest child, who was eight, we called him Freddie then, went up to her like she was an inanimate object and said, Mom, look, I'm taller than her. And I said, oh my goodness, that's okay. <laughs> Everybody is different heights. Yes, but why is she so short? Oh, I, I was really trying to deflect this, but she looked angry. She wasn't helping me. 
<laughs> and he just couldn't stop. And I was never so glad to get in the car with those groceries as that time. And we all chowed down on peanut M&Ms oh, when we got in the car. Except for my baby. But you, you never can be prepared completely when you have children. Um, One of the things that I learned early was that children are just totally curious. They're not meaning to be rude about anything they ask. They just want to know, why is he different? Exactly. And I remember when our son, you know, that has cerebral palsy, he could barely sit up with his legs out like a W, and we had time sitting in a sandbox. And I've thought about writing lesson called, you know, lessons I learned from the sandbox, but these little kids were so curious. And they circled the sandbox, you know, really far out, and they got closer and closer and closer. And finally, they just sat down and started playing in the sand like he was. Just, you know, they were curious. But, you know, sometimes they come up and ask me, you know, why is he, why does he look like he's sleepy? Or, you know, why is he in a chair? And, you know, they're not meaning to be rude. But I've seen adults who are very rude about it because they will just say things or do things in a way that is so disrespectful. For one time, we were in a really nice restaurant in Washington, D.C. on a on a trip, and there was a couple sitting two tables down from us that had both of them had cerebral palsy, and the table between us the couple just took their menus and stood them up where they wouldn't have a view of the couple. And I thought that is one of the rudest things I've ever seen, just acting like, you know, they're not there. And and I think this is one of the things I wanted us to kind of talk about is how do you feel like uh, you can teach children? And since you were in a special education classroom, how did you work with the parents and the children, make it easier for them coming to school and being able to just be different and bridge that gap with the kids that were in school that might have been staring a lot. Did you have a lot of that that you had to deal with? And did you talk to the kids that were doing the staring or did you talk to the kids who were disabled? Yeah, so a lot of times before the child with special needs was integrated into a regular classroom study, we would go and discuss that with the whole class. Why they were look different or act different, and how these children could help them feel at home with the rest of the children. And what I have found is since I was in school compared to now, it has come a long ways. Children are genuinely loving. That's just their natural instinct. They learned the negative behaviors from the adults. And so a lot of times the children are teaching the adults how to behave. Yes, how to show that compassion no matter what a person looks like or acts like. And I I just love it. It's really heartwarming to see that we've come a long ways. Good, because I haven't had a child in school now for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And there was a time I was doing substitute teaching, so I would see things there. But I haven't been in a schoolroom for a while. So I'm glad to know that, you know, because our sons in school, when it was all separate. They like to push the kids around in the wheelchair. They almost fight over whose turn it is to push oh, the daughter, lady, you know. Uh-huh. But the one thing that children need to work on with the help of adults right now what i've seen is inviting these children with special needs to outside activities include them right yes so many times they they are smart enough to know so and so's having a birthday party and i didn't get an invitation and that breaks the parent's heart right not not only their child but the parent's heart too because they want the child to have friends to feel loved. So that's that's a big deal, I think, now that we still need to work on as a society. Uh, I don't think a lot of people understand that. It's true for parents, too. 
once you have a child that has any kind of special need, a lot of the of the friends that you had start dropping off. Mm -hmm. In fact, today I was talking about that with our daughter who came through town and we were asking her, you know, what was it like for you? How did you feel having a, a, a brother that had special needs and everything? And what did you learn from that? And, mm -hmm. you know, she was talking about how she learned how people are different and it didn't, it wasn't scary to her. And yet I think a lot of people are scared. They don't know what's different. They don't understand what's different. So any unknown is just, I want to stay away from it. Mm -hmm. And it's, they don't intend to always be rude. It comes across as being rude. Right. But I've had parents um, say, you know, my friends quit calling me. They don't ask me to do anything anymore. And so the parents are also left out. Yes. What we, we need to work on the whole family of being included in friendships, in church, and neighborhood gatherings, whatever it is, to make allowances for someone to be in a wheelchair or with crutches or canes. We do that easier with older people when they get where they're, you know, having a problem with their walking and they need a, a walker. People adjust to that very easily, for, but for some reason, they don't do that when they don't know the person. You know, yes. they look at them as, you know, they see the chair or they see the difference first instead of yes. how we're alike. And I love the name of your book, Look In Me, because, yes. you know, because that's the problem that a lot of people have. They don't see inside that we're alike. You know, exactly. we loved, we want to be included. We want to have friends and there isn't anybody that I know that is like, no, don't, don't bring me friends. <laughs> That's for sure. I just heard yesterday that loneliness is now an epidemic. I believe it. I think no. one of it is isolated yes. so much. They don't even know how to get back to being in a group anymore. They, they compared that to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's how impactful it is on your health, physical, mental, emotional health, to be lonely. And so, yes, I think you made a good point about the whole family of, you know, the ha children with special needs need to be involved and included and, and not stared at and ignored. Well, and also, if we have a neighbor that is taking care of a spouse or somebody taking care of an old person. We need to remember them, too. It's not just the children that we're talking about. It's, mm -hmm. I think what I've been so sad about and why I decided to start this program on heartfelt perspectives was to say, you know, it hurts me to see people left out, ignored, you know, no one's paying attention, and then for us as a society to move on as if that's no problem, you know, to ignore the people that are stuck at home because it is hard. I, I remember when I got to the point I couldn't lift our son or, and I was confined and it wasn't that I wanted to go somewhere all the time. It was the fact that I couldn't, I literally could not pick him up and put him in the mm -hmm. car to take him somewhere. And so it's, it feels like the walls are closing in more. Mm -hmm. That's what I hear from people that are, you know, at home all the time. And so COVID has really changed our society in, in that way. Yes. I, my nonprofit Pamper Our Parents also helps caregivers. So it's struggling parents that we give our attention to. And if the parents decide that their family needs a vacation, then I try to allow that. It's whatever they feel like the need is. But most of the time, it's the parent or the caregiver needs to get out, needs to have some pampering done. And so that's why I started Pamper Our Parents because I, I remember how hard it was for us just having those eight healthy children and we didn't have the funds to go on an extravagant vacation, just the two of us. We took our children on vacations. <laughs> Right, came first, and so I can relate to how hard it is not to get out and have that alone time. Well, and this is bringing up why I wanted you to be on here. Tell us more about your program because 
I think that people don't realize what you're doing is so important, but it is. And that's how I got to know you. Somebody that one of your relatives introduced us to each other. And for those who don't know me, our son, almost 53 now, he's total care. And when I was young, my health broke down. I was working so hard trying to do everything everybody told me to do. And I had five different people telling me, an hour a day is all it takes, Cheryl. Well, that was the teacher, the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, the speech therapist, and a teacher that was coming to the home. Well, I wore myself out. I had two other children. One was a baby. And then my father-in-law died. We brought his mom to live with us. And my body simply said, that's it. You're going down. And I had to rest, cared for myself for a long time. So we've gone through a lot of different experiences needing help lifting our son and caring for him. And a few years ago, he was in a group home close to us, but we got a call that he had been assaulted by a caregiver. Mm-hmm. And it just upset me so much. I could we just could hardly stand it. And I got the call. We were five minutes from him. And in the car, we could hardly speak. We were both just so hurt. We... You just can't express how sad you are that anybody would take out any on someone that's helpless. Well, then they got to, when we insisted they go to the doctor, they started changing the story and telling us that he did it to himself, which was impossible. He couldn't even use his right hand, and he would have had to use his right hand to beat himself up. Uh, but it just, you know, the I went on a journey trying to find help. And I loaded the car. I said, I don't know when I'll be back, but I'm going to find something better than this. And I turned in the company and to every agency that was out there, hoping that something would happen. But in the meantime, I was proactive and trying to f- do something else. And I, I went down to a large area and I interviewed 14 companies to try to see what they offered And by the end of the week, I thought everything I saw was better than what we had. But at the same time, the man that had started with me to begin with said, you didn't find what you were looking for, did you? And I said, no. And he told me the name of this family that lived about 200 miles from us. And he said, I don't know if they'll help or not, but they had a young man in their home for nine years. He was expected to live too. But he was going downhill, he was losing sight, losing hearing, losing the ability to do anything. Well, they took such good care of him that he lived for nine years. And every time he was in the hospital, then were there with him and their own children went to grandparents. But uh, anyway, we went to visit and he's now been with them. I thought it was 10 years. It's been 12. Wow. And... And that moment that they had him in their home, it was like he was part of their family. And I, I'll tell some other stories another time. But from that first day that he arrived, they had a party in their backyard. He had cooked fajitas for 50. They had all of their friends and family over there to meet Blake. And they brought in a cake. They knew he liked sports. So they brought in a cake that was a baseball diamond, and on it, it said, Welcome home. And I just cried because I did make him feel part of the family. Well, they had three children, three, four, five years old. But those kids immediately said, We want to sleep with Blake. So they put their pallets partly under his bed, but slept in there. They only had a tiny house bedrooms and Blake got one of those bedrooms and their three children stayed in another little bedroom but every year you know we tried to do everything we could to help them every year they got to move a little bit until finally they got to build a house and they built it handicapped accessible because of Blake they were very hard he was left and she went back to school uh to do art uh, teach art but during that time was when Blake first went to stay with him and she told her teacher said I may not be able to be here every time because I care for someone who's 
in a wheelchair. And the teacher was so sweet. He said, just bring him with you. So I got to go to college with her for some of her classes. Wow. So, you know, they have just amazed me because they're always feeding the homeless and they're they're always doing things for other people. And arts are so good. And I just, I, I hope if there's anybody listening to this, if you have a heart to care for someone, check into this kind of situation of being a foster family because they need people who would be willing and able to be able to care for kids, our young people, and now our son is old, but to be able to care for them in a home environment if it's not a home that is dysfunctional. And we had somebody that take care of him once before, and I said, no way, you know, because it's such a dysfunctional home. And even though we loved her, we knew that wasn't the best thing for our son. Mm -hmm. But to know that this family has now been part of our lives, we are so, we, we pray for them constantly, and we are just anything we can do to help them be able to have that time to go somewhere. And it's gotten hard now since COVID because the camp that he used to go to doesn't have enough people to take care of him. He doesn't get to go to camp. So I asked her what they were planning to do this year so we could see, you know, to hire somebody to stay with him. And she said, we're going to take Blake and we're going to go camping. So we'll help them, you know, be able to do that. But he loves to be outside and they know it. And they love taking him. And so I am I just say this with all love in my heart for what you've done. And I want to say, you know, if anybody is listening and they want to know how can you help make life better, you need to get in touch with Diane. This pamper your parents idea was, I've never heard of this before, but about two weeks ago, I received a huge envelope with all these cards written to our special family that's cared for our son and they've never met him but they're sending all of this love in a package that we're going to go and surprise them this coming week take them to eat and then be able to honor them for what they've done for our son but it's coming from people who don't even know them and that's the the beauty of you've started diane is this pamper the parents you look after the people who are doing the the caregiving and those are the people when i was doing a radio show interviewing caregivers they were the ones who were overlooked mm -hmm. what you've done is to say no it's important to recognize what they've done care for and let are them for what see what we can do that would lift their spirits and you know i wish there was some way we could have done a, a big party but i know if we told them what was going to happen and then aired before this comes out so i'm saying it online but uh -huh. <laughs> they're going to make it fun but you know i just think that this is such a wonderful idea i hope it catches on and i hope we can do what people can, if they can find i want to get the information that we will put out there about your site because if people want to donate gift cards if they want to donate money or they want to write letters mm -hmm. even letters are going to mean so much so you know and this is have to say they get a tax deduction i mean it's a win-win situation it's all over the u.s I am in Arizona, but I give gifts all over the U.S., and I really see how the little things make a big difference. Right. Okay. And I'm not here sweating well from you. I was saying what it looks like. Yeah, turn just a slightly so we can see. Yeah, there you go. You can see it better. And that's true. I mean, and the, the love that you have for seeing that people are honored for what they're doing to take care of somebody else is it's magical you know it just it's something that is a gift from the heart that 
uh, I hope that we can help you make this a big event and something that a lot of people will catch on and go, oh, that's something I can do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just like when I asked for people who wanted to send cards to this special family who has Blake, and I told them all they were doing, I had such an outpouring. I mean, that's where I had to get such a large envelope. Was, they, there was like 40 people and already had a volunteer group that made me over a hundred cards, handmade cards that were so pretty and so clever that people just would come and pick the ones they wanted to write in. And so it made it easier for them. And it was all ages. I had like a four year or two year old do it. And then an 85 year old do it. I mean, <laughs> just people were very appreciative to what this family has done for your family. What a blessing. And the fact that they don't even know them, right? It's just it. It's something that you can't put a price tag on any of that, because you've blessed not just them, but you've blessed Blake, you've blessed us, and you've blessed all of our family and all of our friends who find out what you've done. So it's it's a multiplying gift of love, and I hope that this catches on because it's one of those things that could truly make a difference in our world. If people started thinking of somebody else, what can I do? Sending a card, making a phone call, even texting. When Blake was in the hospital for 10 weeks, I had a friend we've never met. Oh. And she has and she had adopted a young lady that had, you know, that is totally dependent on her too. And uh she texts me almost every day. How are you doing? Are you taking care of yourself? Yeah. And we still haven't gotten to meet. But <laughs> we've texted back and forth for years now. And it means so much to me to have a friend that knows what it's like. And when I'm going through things that are hard, and I know when she's having a hard time, and we both have had health issues. And so to just know somebody's there that understands right the empathy is huge isn't it it is it is and that's why i i say i am the best friend of families who have special needs children because i've walked in your shoes i know exactly the problems that you're facing and the the frustrations that you find when you can't find support you can't find resources and so many of the programs people think will work we were too rich too poor too old too young and you fell through the cracks all the time plus the time it takes to try to even research and find what's even there to try to get and a lot of i tell people when families have a special new child they don't even know the questions to ask much less where to find things they don't even know who to ask for the, some of the things that they need to know. And that's why all of this is so important, every part of it. Thank you. I, I agree totally. And you understand more than anybody having been there and done that. When you've lived in it, you do. And, you know, of course, I was helping with my parents, my in-laws, as well as Blake. And it makes it. But I was also brought up in a family that my grandfather was ill for the last 15 years of his life, and I watched how gentle my grandmother was in caring for him. And, you know, he couldn't eat regular foods. They had to be blended or very soft, and she just did it. It was just a way of life. No different. You just needed, uh, you know, provide a little more. And she was the one that got our son to be able to eat table foods quicker because he liked what she was making. You know, she knew how to make it where he could eat it. She and really, mother both, you know, made foods that he could eat. Really is beneficial to be around that and a family. After the education system, I started doing respite and rehabilitation in my home and in clients' home. And so our children that were left at home, I think we had six still, they were really attached to these children that I was caring for. And my oldest son, even now, when they go out somewhere to a movie or to eat dinner, he'll text or call me and say, hey, mom, you, we saw your people out. You know, they were sitting next to us at the movies. I know exactly what he's talking about. But they just, like, have no qualms about interacting with people that are different. That's just wonderful. 
And that's what, you know, we're hoping that the world becomes gentler where people don't feel uh, afraid of somebody that's different, that can learn to just see them as more alike instead of more different, you know, so. Yes, definitely. Well, Ian, is there anything you'd like to tell people that would help you uh, with this organization you've started? Well, you've really done a great kickstart for me. Um, it's almost our third year, and the donations are slow, <laughs> but that's okay because, like I said before, every little thing makes a big difference in these struggling parents' lives, and they can find my website. They can send me an email if they have a different idea because I'm always open to different ideas, and we just want to keep this Pamper Parents a thriving nonprofit. It's It's been so real. Do you think you have helped? I think it's over 200. Wow, in two years? Oh, Almost my. three years. Wow. Yeah, and some of them have had more than just two gifts because they'll have something come up, a child in the hospital like you had for 10 weeks. They need some support for meals, you know, grandpa, DoorDash, things like that right. are very helpful to them. And a lady recently lost her only child who had special needs, and I am going to be making them a blanket, her a blanket of his pictures that she sent me. Now, we, we lost a daughter 21 years ago when she was only 20 in an accident, so I do have a heartfelt place for the people who lose a child um and i just ask her questions what did he like who are his favorite people what did he like to watch on tv and she sent me some videos of him laughing and just a, a lot of information about her son her only son her only child you know i think he was 16 when he passed away last year and she was just happy that someone cared to ask her about her son. And I think more people need to do that. Like you said, communicate with people and let them know that you care and let them talk to you about their loved ones. And it's a lot of work. He was in a wheelchair, nonverbal, um, sounded a lot like Blake, you know, couldn't do a lot for himself, but he sure gave her a lot of love and joy in her life for 16 years. One of my friends uh, that I've known for quite a while, their daughter was killed in a home invasion, and she was like 30. And one day after we moved here and I got to know her, and I, I just asked her, I said, well, tell me about your daughter. And she looked at me and she said, thank you for asking Hardly anybody ever asked me about her, and it's as if they feel it feels like she's never lived. Mm -hmm. And so I think people understand how it feels to never be asked about somebody, that it ought to open our hearts to say, man, if I lost one of my children, what would I, how would I feel? You know, and to never have anybody ask you about them or acknowledge that they had lived any would be a very, very difficult thing. So that's we had that experience with our daughter even. Some people didn't know what to say, so they walked around far away from us just so they wouldn't have to say anything. Just just tell that parent, I'm sorry that happened to you or, and talk about the child. But and we have also had some that said, Well, it's a good thing you have so many children. Right. Like they're gonna take the place of the one that's yeah. there. Yeah, each individual was important. Just because we had eight and we lost one, that was devastating. Right, you know, they they have a place in the world, and all of a sudden they're gone. And yeah, people need to be more heartwarming towards that type of situation. Well, and uh, I think it's just such a, a a place of ignorance, and that's where mm -hmm. we need to communicate. And you know, what does it feel like, and help people understand. The small things in life are what really makes everything possible, everything better, and those are easy to do. But don't ignore somebody. Don't ignore somebody. 
Right. Easy, easy education, right? Right. <laughs> it doesn't cost any money. That's right. It doesn't. But, well, thank you so much for being with me today, Diane. I, it's been such a pleasure to get to visit with you again. And if you can um, tell me, we'll we'll put out the information how people can get in touch with you because that is such a wonderful thing that you're doing, improving the lives of many people. Thank you, Cheryl. Well, thank you, and I look forward to seeing you again before too long. Sounds good. Take care. God bless. You too. Thank Bye-bye. you. And y'all have a, a wonderful day too, and I look forward to the next time. If you feel like this has been a helpful interview, I hope you will make it a point to share it with other people. And let's pass the word that being kinder and gentler in our society is what people need more than anything. Don't ignore people. Help them feel loved and have attention paid to them. We all need it. We we thrive on knowing that we're loved and we need attention. Have a great day, and we'll look forward to our next get-together. Bye.